So we can do this, we can vary uh, different outcomes as much as we want. We can look at as many different types of scenarios as we want. Um, but what you'll notice now here is that instead of having one net present value that I can make my decision on, meaning if we look at the expected case, I have an MPV of 478,000. My MPV rule is again, it's very black and white. Positive MPV, take the project. Negative MPV, reject the project. But instead of just having one net present value, now I have a four different matrices with 12 different net present values on them. And notice that in each matrix, we have some negative MPVs and some positive MPVs. As we move from more pessimistic scenarios where we end up with negative outcomes to more optimistic scenarios where we end up with more, even more positive outcomes. So that means that our baseline net present value rule is not going to be as effective anymore. And it's not going to be as effective, not because the rule is wrong, but because now that I have more potential outcomes, I'm going to have to adjust that rule from being just one that's based on one potential outcome. And, and so we, we tend to shift here when we start talking about scenario and sensitivity analysis, and we start coming up with this whole uh, potential universe of outcomes. You know, here we're looking at you know, 40 or 50 or 60 different outcomes, um, is we start looking at what percentage of those outcomes have a positive MPV and what percentage of those outcomes have a negative MPV. And that is going to help us decide uh, to maybe, maybe not decide, that's going to help us broaden our decision rule. So we go from this, uh, you know, one-off case rule with a very black and white choice, and we move to a uh, multi-case rule uh, with a more nebulous choice, uh, with a lot of gray area. Uh, and, and this is now going to be dependent on what we think the outcome should, should be. So let's look at, let's again, let's look at these four matrix, matrices. We have, let's say, maybe 75% of the outcomes of the cells in each of these matrices are positive in PV, and 25% are negative. Is that enough to take a project? Well, we're not sure. That's going to depend on how comfortable we are with the level of risk that we're taking. It's going to depend on how high the level of investment is uh, uh, and, and, and what kind of capital we're going to have to put at risk. Um, it's going to depend on what level of success we've had with projects like this in the past. It's going to depend on the way the company is uh, you know, financially at the time. It's going to depend on the, the way the market is financially at the time. There may be a lot of things that start to factor into our previously cut and dry decision, take a positive MPV project. Well, now we're sitting here and we're saying, okay, well, in some worlds, there isn't any, uh, there, this project is positive, in some worlds this project is negative. We're not really sure which ones are most likely quite yet. Um, and so we start to make decisions like, if 75% of our scenario analyses come back positive, we take the project. We think that it's probably going to be a good one. Right? That means in 75% of futures, uh, this is a positive project, and, and in the other 25%, it's a failure. Uh, and that's a, a definitely a more realistic way to look at the world, uh, but it also makes our decision rule harder because we went from something that was clear cut to something that isn't anymore, and now we're going to have to rely on more assumptions, more decision analysis. This is another place where uh, you know the, the, the leadership of the managing team and of the financial analysis team comes into play. Uh, in, in making these now more nebulous decisions. Now, scenario analysis is what happens when I assume that changes in the future of the project will not just affect one variable at a time, but are likely to affect a multiple, uh, a, 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 a multitude of different variables. Uh, and so, we've, again, we might expect that a pessimistic scenario is that you know we don't sell as many products because uh, we had some faulty design, we had to do a recall. That's not just going to affect sales, it's also going to affect my fixed costs. Maybe I have to do some layoffs, it's going to affect my variable costs because maybe I need to uh, buy more uh, expensive inputs to so that I don't have this deep defect. Uh, maybe I have some uh, you know additional costs that are associated with fixing all these things. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, it, it might cause the, the company to change in a lot of different ways. Scenario analysis allows us to vary two or more variables at a time and see the impact on net present value. And so here's the, the slide that we have. These are based on the inputs above. Uh, this is net present value being calculated 
for instance, when the investment required is our expected investment, 5.4 million, but the discount rate, the required rate of return, is lower uh, than our expected required rate of return of 8%. And, and so when the risk is lower, remember risk and return go one vary one for one. So if the return is lower, discount rate is lower, the required return is lower, my risk must be lower. Uh, and, and so uh, then I have a higher net present value because I have a lower risk. Uh, and you can see that uh, we vary these uh, across the board. Um, we can vary the variable costs in the discount rate. I can vary sales in the discount rate. I could vary sales in the investment rate. Uh, and, and that would be a pretty common one to see, for instance. We might expect that if I was going to if I was going to anticipate a much higher level of sales, that it might also come with a much higher level of investment in fixed assets because I, so let's say I need more machinery to uh, to build uh, the the higher level of product, right? A greater level of product, rather. Um, and so we might uh, we might vary lots of different. These are just some examples. We would vary lots of different things. And again, um, as I mentioned in the lecture, what we're looking for is now not just whether our net present value on a single basis is positive but whether our net present value across all of our scenarios is positive on average, right? Or, or is positive above a certain percentage level. So here we can see that about 75% of the net present values that we analyze are positive, right? So these are all positive, these are all positive, these are all positive, these are all positive, so about 75%, let's see, that's 34 of 48 are positive. So about 75% are positive. The rest are negative MPVs. So that one too. Um, and, and so what we want to ask ourselves is, does our decision rule change slightly? Um, and the answer is yes, it's going to change to be more of a probability-based rule now. And we'll say, for each company, is going to say based on uh, their own personal preferences. Uh, but, uh, you know, if... If more than 75% of our scenario outcomes are positive, we take the project, uh, and, and otherwise we reject it, uh, which is slightly different than just saying, if the net present value is positive, we take the project. Um, but this is a, a way to help us guide our decision making and, and hopefully to make better decisions in, in the future. We can go even farther than scenario analysis, and, uh, and this last step, uh, this last uh, hurdle here is something called simulation analysis. And simulation is, is merely an extension that allows you to examine any number of potential interactions, right? Where scenario analysis is asking for a specific economic situation that you think might arise and how all the, you know, a mixture of different but uh, consistent variables are gonna interact in that situation. Uh, simulation analysis just literally says anything is possible these variables could have any potential combination. We don't care what the scenario is that causes this combination. We just want to look at every single possible potential future outcome for every single one of our variables at once, right? So in other words, sales could be anything from $1 per year to $200 million per year. And we could look at the net present value for each of those sales potent possibilities at $1 increments. What's the MPV of sales is a dollar. What's the MPV of sales is $2. What's the MPV of sales is 100 million, if 100 million and one. And then we can do the same thing for every other variable in the analysis. What about costs? What if costs are 1% or 2% or 3%? And we could vary each one of those and interact it with all of the other potential combinations in sales. For a total of hundreds of millions of potential MPVs or billions of MPVs. Now this starts to get technically rigorous and it starts to get computationally difficult. We can't really do simulation analysis using Excel. Just can't handle that many potential observations. Right? Excel actually technically maxes out at like a million by a million rows and columns. That's a really big spreadsheet. But when we're talking about simulation analysis, we're talking about 10 times that amount. So we need uh, more sophisticated statistical software. Uh, when someone, if you ever hear people talking about big data analysis, this is the kind of thing they're talking about taking all the potential data, manipulating it, analyzing it in a statistically proper way, and coming up with now a new distribution of outcomes that are possible for this project, and 
now we have a new uh, potential probability of success for this project or failure for this project. So this is a much more uh, you know, complicated process. It's not something that we'll go into any detail further here. Uh, it's not something that any company that is doing a discounted cash flow analysis on a project is also going to step in and do a simulation analysis on their potential project unless a ton, a ton of money is at stake. Even sensitivity and scenario analysis, uh, you know, it takes a more sophisticated financial team to start to think about these things. And, and, and the more sophisticated the technique and the more computationally difficult the process, uh, the more time and effort and uh, expertise it takes, the more expensive it is to do. And remember that there is a cost to doing this analysis in the beginning, in the first place. And, and so you have to weigh off that cost with the, the cost of investing in the project altogether. Right? I mentioned in the last lecture that you know, Amazon does diff uses different decision rules um, uh, they, depending on whether the total investment required by the project is great or small. They don't want to assign a whole team of, of experienced analysts to run a simulation analysis on a project that only costs $10,000. It's just not worth it. it. There'll be a net loss because whatever the project brings in, it's going to cost more to put the team to work on it. Right. So this kind of thing, uh, you know, it, it, it's only relevant for certain kinds of projects, but, but it is a valuable tool uh, that allows us to get a much more accurate prediction about the future and, and prediction about uh, and, and help us make better decisions. Now, obviously, uh, these three things, they all require Excel. It's not going to be something I'm testing you on in the homework. It's not something I can really conceivably test you on in an exam setting either, uh, but it is something I definitely might ask you about. Uh, just in general as one of the concept type questions. But, but you shouldn't expect to see anything further relating to how to do a sensitivity or scenario analysis, uh, especially because so far, you know, on exam or, or homework, you're only doing those by hand. And, and that means that solving for 12 different MPVs for the same project because you changed a variable, that takes a long time by hand. It takes almost no time in Excel. Okay, so, now that we have used sensitivity and scenario analysis to identify the most important variables in our analysis, the most sensitive uh, uh, variables that will affect our decision, we want to go more into detail um, and we want to start to think a little bit more deeply about where the proper cutoff should be when we accept a project. Um, and because sales ends up being the most important variable and the most our, our analysis is going to be most sensitive to the level of sales. We're going to go a little bit deeper into uh, thinking about our predictions of sales uh, and what's appropriate and what's not. Um, and this is a process called the break-even analysis. So we're going to look at a couple different ways that a company might break even in terms of sales um, and how that is going to affect our decision-making process going forward. Uh, and break-even is something you probably heard of before. It's a really common term, and it has a very straightforward meaning. Right? The level of sales at which a project or a company breaks even is the level of sales at which uh, sales covers relevant costs. Right? And there's a couple different levels of relevant costs. And so we'll look at each of those different levels and we'll talk about uh, what that means. But basically what we're doing is we're building a series of hurdles that the project has to clear. So what's the level of sales at which the project can just, we bring in just enough money to keep running? And what's the level of sales at which we bring in just enough money to pay all our bills, but we don't make any profit, right? So here we're barely keeping the lights on. Here I'm paying every bill, I'm on time, I'm paying all my employees, I'm doing everything right, but I'm not making any profit. And then what's the level of sales at which I'm making a good profit, a, a justifiable level of profit? at which I'm making a financially prudent level of profit. So these are the hurdles that the project has to clear in order to become a profitable and, and, and beneficial project, which is a little bit deeper than just saying, is it positive MPV or not? We wanna to start to think about how close to the line we are to all of these things. We might have a positive MPV project that's only just barely over the break-even point where I'm paying everybody. Well, what if my predictions are wrong? Well, now I've, accepted a project that's so close to the line that if I made a pro a, a, an optimistic assumption when I should have made a pessimistic one, I may have been led to take a bad project and that may put everybody at risk. So uh, we're gonna talk about break-even analysis for the rest of the chapter. Uh, and, and to start talking about break-even analysis, we need to do spend a little more time talking about 
the differences between what are called fixed and variable costs.